is CNN Student News. You give us 10 minutes, we'll give you current events with zero commercials. I'm Carl Azus. We're starting today on the Korean Peninsula. Even though an armistice ended fighting in the Korean War in 1953, North and South Korea are still divided and they're still rivals. The North is a communist dictatorship. The South is a republic and an ally of the U.S. That's why the world was concerned when things got heated once again earlier this month. Landmines badly wounded two South Korean soldiers who were patrolling the demilitarized zone between the two countries. North Korea denied laying them, but South Korea responded by making propaganda broadcasts across the border. That infuriated the North. Troops were mobilized. Talk of war was in the air. But things settled down yesterday when the two sides reached an agreement. North Korea said it regrets that South Korean soldiers were injured by landmines, and South Korea planned to stop its propaganda broadcasts. The DMZ is 160 miles long, and it cuts through the Korean peninsula. And despite being called a demilitarized zone, it's one of the most heavily guarded military barriers in the world. About a million active duty troops to the north, about 600,000 to the south, and big reserves as well, all on a footing for war, really, for the past 60 years, in case there might be an invasion from the other side. Now we've seen some new skirmishes, and the latest point of contention is this, these high-tech speakers that the South is using to broadcast messages into the North. How could this make such a difference? Well, you have to consider the power of these speakers and the nature of the messages. These speakers, one unit, for example, set in the mountains along the South here, would have the capability of reaching by day about six miles into the North, by night about 12 miles in when the sound carries a little bit better. The messages that have been sent recently have been very sharply critical of the northern leadership. Sometimes they use defectors to the south to call out to their former countrymen. And the north feels a little bit powerless to do anything about this in terms of a quid pro quo, because even though they have their own speaker systems, theirs will only carry about a mile. And in some cases, that will not even get them across the DMZ itself. To the Middle Eastern country of Lebanon, in the capital of Beirut, streets filled with garbage have become a battlefield. Lebanon is a republic without a president. Its parliament, which chooses the president, can't agree on one. The government, like Lebanon's population, is divided between Christian, Sunni Muslim, and Shia Muslim leadership. Different government factions want different people to be president. Parliament's been deadlocked for more than a year. It also hasn't been able to deal with infrastructure problems, accusations of corruption, and garbage collection. So a protest over uncollected trash turned into an uprising last weekend. Hundreds of people and dozens of police were injured. Demonstrators want to overthrow the government, but the international community doesn't want that to happen. Lebanon seen as a relatively calm part of an unstable region with Syria on its eastern border. More than a million refugees from Syria's civil war have fled to Lebanon. And with Israel bordering to the south, there are concerns about a possible conflict between that country and a Lebanese militia it's fought with in the past. Geography, history, and folklore factor into our next story today. It's set in the Owl Mountains there in southwest Poland. This was Nazi-controlled territory during World War II. At that time, Nazi Germany was working on a project called Riza, or Giant. It was this huge network of underground train tunnels in the region. It was never finished. But there's a legend that a Nazi train loaded with gold, art, and jewels was hidden in the Owl Mountains, and it could be armed. Some say it's truth, some say it's myth, some say they've found it. In the shadow of a 700-year-old castle, in a labyrinth of tunnels deep underground, two treasure hunters in Poland say they've made a remarkable discovery, a Nazi train loaded with up to 300 tons of treasure. The district council has received a letter from a law firm in Rocklaw. We were informed that the men, a Poland German, represented by a law firm, have discovered a German train. The Nazi ghost train, a local legend, reportedly lost in the final days of the Second World War. The year, 1945. Allied forces were closing in on Nazi-held territory. As the Germans fled, they loaded a train with stolen gold, gems, and weapons. It left Wrocław, Poland, 
bound for Wolbzik through a series of tunnels built to secretly move Nazi goods. It never reached its destination. After the war, the tunnels were sealed and long forgotten. The very existence of the ghost train remained a mystery. No one has ever been able to confirm the existence of this train. There are no documents about localization of it. Polish authorities are taking the men's claim seriously, saying lawyers, the army, the police, and the fire brigade are dealing with this. The area has never been excavated before, and we don't know what we might find. The men have no plans to release their identities or to reveal the location of the train until they're guaranteed 10% of the value of whatever is found inside. Local media reporting that the contents could be worth billions. Wolf Blitzer, CNN, Washington. CNN Student News Roll Call is taking us all over the world this year, and for the first time ever, we're visiting Australia. In the northeastern state of Queensland, thank you for watching at the Chuar Independent School. It's in Chuar. To the U.S. North, like way up north, like north of the Arctic Circle North, Kotzebue, Alaska is home to the Huskies of Kotzebue Middle School. And all the way across the country in Yulee, Florida, we've got the Hornets online today at Yulee High School. A massive sell-off on the U.S. stock market yesterday. After global markets took a hit, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, an average of 30 significant U.S. stocks, closed down 588 points. Not its worst day ever, but its worst point drop since 2011. After it opened Monday, the market free fell over a thousand points in 10 minutes. It had never fallen that fast before. It bounced up and down wildly after that. Factors include China, oil, subjects we covered in depth on yesterday's show at cnnstudentnews.com. Lori Weiss says her organization's goal is to address the effects that poverty has on pets. She runs Downtown Dog Rescue in Los Angeles. Every year it helps about 2,000 animals stay with their owners. Her work for people and their furry friends makes her today's character study. I really believe most people want what's best for their pet. Now, do they have the resources? No. I just don't want to lose my life. I got so attached. <laughs> so many times people just feel they have to surrender their animal. When in reality, if they understood all the resources, they are happy to keep their animal. I'll make some phone calls to see if there's anybody that would be willing to foster. I started an organization which offers resources to low-income families so they can keep their pets. The areas we work tend to have the higher crime rates, densely populated, and there's lots of animals. There is a lot of people that are either not employed, they're underemployed, but that does not mean that people don't love their animals. Are you interested in a free neuter for him? We offer free spay and neuter, vaccines. Can you handle this? Dog food, medical services. Oh my God, oh, it's mommy, come here, Reno. Our job is to find out who is this person? How can we best help them? It's crazy because I'm a foster child and then you're fostering my dog. We are offering them as much as we can to be successful with their pet. This is a boy who loves to play. It gives me a lot of joy to see the dogs with their family. You know, he's so nervous about his dog dying. He thanked me like five times. Everybody in life needs to find their purpose. And for me, it was really helping people with their animals. Call it the Aurora Borealis, call it the Northern Lights. Most of those who've seen it would call it beautiful. We're guessing Scott Kelly is with them, but he has a bit of a different perspective. He's aboard the International Space Station about 220 miles over our heads and he shot this time-lapse of the Aurora Borealis just before sunrise. From Earth's perspective, it gives a totally different view of our aurora. And who'd say it wasn't the time or the space? After all, it's just an astronaut expressing his views. They're just reflected on a higher plane, y'all. I'm Carl Azus. I'm out of puns, and I'm out of time. Come on back tomorrow.